Well, Maya, look at what you do. I'm ex I just so excited to talk with you. And you're listed, you know, your bio talks about labels you as a cognitive scientist. It talks about behavioral science, talks about behavioral economics, all terms that I love. I also put in there behavioral psychology. But if you take all those in context, where would you say your interest lies? How do you label yourself? Yeah, well, first of all, it's great to be on, Kevin. <laughs> it's so nice to meet you. Um, that's a great question. Uh, like you said, cognitive science is, is such a broad umbrella category, right? It's really the study of how our minds work. I would say my focus in terms of my research and my PhD and my postdoc have been um, has been in the science of decision making. So how is it that we make decisions? How is it that we form our attitudes and beliefs about the world? And um, I think the most relevant theme to my new podcast, The Slight Change of Plans, is how is it that we navigate change as humans? How do we respond to change? How do we inspire change within others and ourselves? Um, how do we get people to change their minds, which is one of the most elusive forms of change? And over the years, I've obviously studied this from a scientific perspective, but change has been such a prominent feature of my personal life. Um, and I was so eager to dig into it through a more anthropo anthropological lens, you know, yeah. which is to try to understand whether we can mine insights from people's stories about how it is that they've navigated change. Well, when you say that navigate, do you tend to come from the perspective, and I listened to some of your shows and, you know, like what happened to you. So here you are going along as a violinist and this thing happened to you that you then had to respond to. Do you find in the topic of change that you're focusing more on how do people respond to something that requires change and or people who look and say, I would like something to change, but I'm going to have to proactively make it happen. Yeah, it's, it's the full gamut. I mean, we explore so many different contours of change. And I think one of the most fascinating things I've learned from A Slight Change of Plans and the interviews I've done with guests is I used to have this very clean model in my mind. You know, there's will yeah. change, right? There's the change that we proactively try to inspire in our lives. And then there's unwill change, which is, you know, often unexpected and, and has a negative dimension to it. And I think I... I've updated my beliefs when it comes to how I categorize change as a result of these interviews. So it used okay. to be the case that I did compartmentalize them into these two buckets. And now I see them as blending a bit more than I used to. And the reason for that is I'm realizing that because change doesn't happen in a vacuum, like any specific change doesn't happen in isolation, it's actually really important that we treat both willed and unwilled change with the same degree of humility. Okay. Because we can't anticipate all the ways in which a specific change might change other parts of us or our lives. Uh, so a very poignant example of this is I interviewed a young woman, Elma Baker. Um, it was her lifelong goal to lose weight and become thin. She genuinely believed that if she could just lose the weight, she would be able to live her dream life. And she was successful, Kevin. Like she lost nearly a hundred pounds in five wow. and a half months. Wow. And for a while, she did believe that she was living her dream life until she realized that changing in that particular way was leading to all of these unintended consequences, so to speak, all of these unexpected side effects. What she found is that she was losing big parts of who she was and what she valued. She was less bold. She felt she was more superficial. She felt she wasn't as kind to people as she had been prior. She was valuing very different things. And um, what that story taught me was, wow, here's, here's a change that this person willed in their own life, right? She was so adamantly of the, of the belief that she, she so adamantly believed that this would be a net good thing. And wow. then she found actually it was, it was, had really negative effects on her life. And then the flip side of that is I interviewed a young gentleman named Scott, who um, is a cancer researcher and also a self-proclaimed health nut. So he does everything under the sky you can imagine to try to optimize uh, for his health. He's vegan. He does intermittent fasting. He pours turmeric on all of his food. He sleeps, you know, a certain fixed number of hours every night in order to, you know, align with the best research. And then in the middle of 2020, in the middle of, of the coronavirus pandemic, um, 
he finds himself in the throes of a stage four cancer diagnosis that requires him to get a leg amputated within weeks. And he's had multiple surgeries since then, including getting a vertebra removed from his spine and six rounds of chemotherapy uh, inpatient in MD Anderson in Texas. So he's had to move from California to Texas for this. And what he shared with me is in his mind, his worst nightmare came true. Um, but as he's sitting there drinking a cup of coffee on his you know, backyard patio, he's thinking to himself, you know, this horrible thing happened to me. And yet here I am feeling like, even though the lows might be lower, right? Even though there's more volatility in my life, the good moments are just as good. And I feel in some ways as happy as I was before. Um, what an, in, you know, and he's reflecting to me, like, what an interesting feature of my own psychology. I would never have expected that I would grow from this experience and become a better, more empathetic person who actually stabilized in terms of happiness levels. And so that's another example of how a very unexpected negative change in his life, um, he, he found positive aspects to. Um, and so Again, to summarize, I think what this has taught me about change is I would now give the same advice to someone, whether they were going through um, a change that they wanted or a change they didn't want, which is to be exceedingly humble in the face of the change and very open-minded and observant about the ways in which that change is affecting our own psychology. It feels like you are calling us to whatever change we have laid out there that we desire or the one that we fear we need to really audit and go deep on because I listened to your story, Maya, on that. It was on one of your shows, I think, and you talked about the guy who got cancer and it stuck out to me because I thought that's me. I mean, I have, I have another podcast. You don't even know, uh, called the true life podcast where we talk about health and wellness mm -hmm. and it's, uh, based on functional medicine and it's a preventative mm -hmm. aspect of health and wellness of looking at what can we do to keep cancer in essence, you know, from happening or at least stave it off as much as possible. And of course I sit here and we talk about it on the show thinking, I can't guarantee that I don't get cancer next week. Now I, I'm going to assume that if I did, maybe I held it off five years from when it would have happened otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that these healthy things add up, but your quote, and I actually wrote it down from the guy was if I had known the way I would psychologically respond to this event, I wouldn't have spent so much time being fearful of it in the first place that's dramatic. So again, it's to the so looking stirring. at what do yeah. we desire and what do we fear in regards to change and really going deeper. That's what it was a call to me of us all. Let's take the desires or, or the change that we desire and fear. I need to look at those and really question those. Cause I think we tend to take them at face value. I'm afraid I do somewhat. And what you're finding out is there's a lot more to the story. Yeah, that's such a astute observation. And, and I love the way you put it, you know, around auditing our change experiences. And again, one another thing I'm learning is just how diverse the human response can be in the face of change. So I just did an interview a week or two ago with a gentleman um, named Ramsey. He woke up one morning in his very early 20s, probably 21 or so. He's a college student um, to the sounds of these blaring car sirens. And it took him a moment to realize that those sounds were actually originating from within his own brain, that he had developed severe and debilitating tinnitus, um, which is again, this constant ringing. And uh, they didn't understand what had caused uh, this particular um, issue. You know, obviously when you, when you talk with like veterans, you know, military service members, they can get to tinnitus because they've had loud military explosions going off and it can lead to this, again, really debilitating condition. And one thing he shared with me, Kevin, is he said, for a while, doctors were concerned that um, I might have brain cancer. So I remember getting the MRI scan. And what was so interesting for him is that he learned he did not, in fact, have brain cancer. But he said, it was so much less reassuring than he thought it would be to learn that fact, because now suddenly he felt vulnerable for the yeah. first moment in his life. And he thought to himself, well, I might not have brain cancer now, but I will get brain cancer. I will get all these things. Like I've proven to myself now that my body can fail without explanation, you know, overnight. And so now what? And it's, it's the story of like wrestling with 
feelings of, you know, lack of control and um, no longer feeling invincible and him grappling with this condition that never attenuates, by the way, you know, he continues to have this high frequency tone overlaying his entire sensory experience in the world, um, but, but how he made peace with that. And I just find it, it's so interesting because as someone who studies change and has studied change, um, there's no scientific textbook out there about how humans navigate big life changes. And in large part, a slight change of plans is a journey I'm taking with listeners where we dive deep into this world of change and try to make sense of all of it because the human experience is so diverse and there's so many different insights we can glean from one another and such differences in the way that we respond to different stories. So I think of listeners of this show as having to be also very observant um, and discerning. Like, does that, would that insight fit my personality and my circumstances? Or right. actually, do I resonate more with so-and-so, you know? Um, so it, it does feel in many ways like a conversation between listener and guest because there's no one size fits all approach for how to navigate change. Your story about the lady, well, actually I want to, it says she lost a hundred pounds and then was not real satisfied with the results of who she became in the process. Mm -hmm. What happened with her since then? Yeah, I mean, so the episode's coming out, not this, oh, sorry, I should retake that because I just realized this will be airing in July. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. so I mean, it's a fascinating uh, episode that that listeners of your show, you know, I'd love to have tune in. Um, what ended up happening was it inspired a mental health journey. What she realized is that maybe the underlying problem was that she was just unhappy and she was trying to find all these ways to optimize her life, uh, not appreciating that the real work that she had to do um, was in her mindset, in the way that she was like processing her life and her past. And so, again, I, I one thing that I observed from, from her story and, and one approach I take with interviewing is... I don't like the clean narrative, you know, where at the end you wrap up the present with a bow and you say, and now I no longer worry about my weight. And I've realized that what really matters is what in, what's inside. No, that's absolutely not Elna's story. She's still deeply conflicted about her body. She still continues to diet and exercise and do all these things to maintain her weight. It's just having gone through that profound change and it not having given her what she expected it would give her. She now thinks about change somewhat differently, which is look, I can put in the effort to change myself, but now I know I'm never going to get what I thought I would. I'm never mm -hmm. going to get necessarily what I wanted, but that's okay because there are times where I will grow anyway. I will grow in spite of that disconnect between what I was hoping for and what I got. And I should just try to learn as much as I can from it. Okay. Well, let's not tie this one up into a tidy little <laughs> bow and I'll take you, I'll take you, uh, I'll join you on that journey because my two episodes before this one uh, is mm. going to publish, the question that I put out there as I was thinking about it, as I spent a lifetime in personal development and self-help and health and wellness and pursuing, you know, always getting better. That's a concept, always getting better, always yeah. improving, is do we inherently really want to change? Or is there some aspect of that feeling a little sometimes offensive that I have to change? Because we also have this world, this culture that I think is crying out for, can I just be okay as I am? Do I really mm -hmm. have to keep striving? So do we, so, and maybe th that story that we just talked about is relevant. Did she really want to change or did she really just want some results that she thought the change might bring, which then by proxy makes change kind of a necessary evil, not some inspiring desire we have. Yeah, I love that question. I mean, I think in many ways, like you said, she was hoping for an end result, mm -hmm. which was to gain happiness and peace and to feel that she was worthy of love, but she went about it with the wrong means. You know, right. she misdiagnosed what the underlying problem was. Um, not to her own fault. I mean, there's lots of societal pressures that make us believe that we ought to change in lots of ways that don't actually require change. Um, but I think her story is so universally appealing because I think we can all identify within ourselves this psych psychology of, oh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with who I am, but oh, if I could just change this one thing about myself, if I could just get this one thing to change, um, then I would be so much better off. I'd be so much happier. I could actually achieve my goals or my dreams or what have you. And I think there is a human, there's a cognitive fallacy baked into that, which is 
when we think about change and we think about the future, we tend to believe that everything in our life will stay exactly as it is. It'll be totally stable and constant. And we'll just tweak this one thing. So in the case of Elna, right. Elna believed, oh, I'll still be exactly the same Elna. I'll just be the thin version. Not recognizing, as I was talking about earlier, that um, change doesn't happen in a vacuum. It can have all sorts of spillover effects into other parts of our lives yeah. that we simply uh, can't predict. But I think, um, you know, it's a really interesting question of whether we desire change in general. I think um, in many ways, our minds are built for change. You know, um, 2020 made that very salient for so many of us, which is we just got thrown um, this major event that we could all commiserate over because everyone all over the world was, was dealing with this unprecedented amount of change. But change is not new in the context of the human condition. I mean, we as a civilization have been confronting change forever and have been finding ways to manage and cope and confront change. And so um, in some ways, like our minds are built for change, absolutely. But then in other ways, you know, we have cognitive biases that really prevent us from desiring change. Like we have a status quo bias um, mm -hmm. that really, where we just prefer, uh, you know, inertia, essentially. It's like, let's just keep things as they are. Let's not disrupt um, the, the status quo because it's filled with a lot of anxiety and trepidation and fear of the unknown. Um, and so I think we have conflicting, view, most people have a lot of conflicting views in their own minds about whether it is that they desire or crave change. I mean, most of us are like, well, I want, oh, I love the good change. I just don't want the bad change. Right. Um, but naturally, you know, that's not actually the human experience that can never be possible. And I keep questioning along with this, again, on this concept of change, which I'm a, I'm a word guy. I, I tend to look up, you know, what is the actual root meaning? And, and it is to be different in a sense. It's mm. to change is to be different. And again, when we look at ourselves as individuals, do I really want to be different? I kind of want to be okay a, again, as I am. Yeah. So is it changing who I am or can I, and what I was making, what I was playing with and kind of veering towards was maybe giving us a deep breath of saying, it's not changing who we are, but changing how we are. So mm. I, I still hope that I have good intent, that I want to do the right thing, that I'm a good guy, but I'm getting some results that I don't like. Let's take relationships. Mm -hmm. And it may be based on because I'm not a good listener. I'm impatient and I'm really being self-focused. Well, I, I can change how I am there. I can practice listening. I can practice being caring about somebody and, and stopping my, again, my own self-centeredness, I can change that. Is it, is it, but does it give me a little more grace maybe mm -hmm. to look at? It's not changing who I am because I'm playing with this message of everybody who's out there, you know, looking at change and does it feel a little bad? Can you look at changing, not just, who, not who you are necessarily, but how you are. How does that resonate with you? Or do you think that there's some people going, no, I really want to change who I am, the essence of myself? Well, there's this interesting concept in cognitive science called identity foreclosure and refers to the fact that, especially young people, adolescents, but certainly this phenomenon can continue into adulthood. Um, people tend to feel very fixed in their identities. They come to a conclusion very quickly about who it is that they are, what they love, what yeah. they do. And then they're unwilling to explore other pathways. They're unwilling okay. to engage in a malleable state of mind in which they explore who else they could be in this world. And I, on a personal level, had to fight this because my whole life as a child, as you were mentioning, I was a violinist, first yeah. and foremost. It was the most defining feature of my identity. And then suddenly at age 15, I have a sudden acute hand injury and I'm incapable of playing the violin professionally and basically generally ever again. And um, I, in that moment, had to ask myself this existential question, Kevin, which is, who am I without the violin? And I was forced to challenge my desire to engage in identity foreclosure and to open myself up and start um, start reminding myself that there are so many opportunities to explore in the world and so many other passions I could uh, identify with. Um, but I think what was so important and what I learned from that experience is to not necessarily attach my identity to things or pursuits, 
but to character traits or um, the traits of a pursuit I enjoy. So to make that concrete in the case of violin, well, what, it, what is it that I loved about the violin? Sure, I love the physical instrument. I love the sound it made. But what I really loved about the violin, the part that made me Maya was emotionally connecting with people through this artistic medium right? Okay. Having the ability to forge a connection with an audience, uh, people who I'd never met before, but we could bond in this really intimate way through music. Another thing that um, I might identify with is the enjoyment of seeing myself progress. Um, you know, tends to be the case that the more hours you practice violin, the better you get. So maybe that's another trait, right? I, I'm, I'm gritty, right? I really enjoy um, you know, committing myself to a pursuit and doing as well as I possibly can in that pursuit. And so um, I think if you can identify the features of something that you enjoy, then you can try to search for those traits in other activities and other passions. Um, you know, for example, when it came to this podcast, in many ways, it's not at all similar to the violin, but it's really similar to the violin in the sense I get to meet with people that I admire and I respect and whose stories are fascinating. And I get to emotionally connect with them. I get to ask them deep probing questions that I might not be able to get. I might not be able to ask them if we were just at a dinner party, right? It's like, hi, Hillary Clinton. Um, apropos of nothing, can you tell me about the hardest moment of your life? You know? Yeah. Um, and so I do feel like it's one, I think it's okay to question who you are. And in the process of questioning who you are, you can figure out that actually maybe it's not things that make us us, uh, but it is, again, traits, characteristics that make us us that can sustain across many different life changes. Does that make sense? Yes. And I love you using the word features. I'm sitting here thinking about that. What are the features that we can, in essence, transfer? I, I have a friend, speaking of you know the arts, Scott Stearman. He's a renowned sculptor. He did sculptor. He does life-size mm -hmm. sculptures. And he had a guy, it was actually at an event that I led a long time ago, but a branding guy say, Scott, what is the essence of what you do? And a way to think about that is what would you do if you could not use your hands? You could mm -hmm. not sculpt. And he had to step back and do what you did. Go to the essence of what is it that I get out of sculpting? Where else could I do that? And for him, it was a little easier because he used to be involved in media and it was still taking a story and sharing it with people and impressing mm. this, you know, history or, or, or this moment uh, indelibly into their brain. He could do that in other mediums besides that. But I mean, to what you say, I don't know if there's any of us that haven't experienced that. I was a professional cyclist and mm. that's who I was. That's what I, I was the answer to. So what do you do? Yeah. Well, and I took pride in it. Well, I'm a professional <laughs> cyclist. And then that ended. You can't do that forever. I'm 50 yeah. now and, and uh, you can't do that. And I had to look at what is the essence of that. And mm -hmm. that's not something that we, I don't know any medium that we're taught to do that. We're told to, hey, you're good at that. Go get your degree in that. Go do that. And that becomes who we do. And then, you know, as well as I do, so many people where the job comes to an end for whatever reason. Yeah. And they have no idea. That's what they know how to do. They have no idea how to transfer that. So again, you're back to, I keep coming up with auditing. We're back to auditing <laughs> the essence of yeah. what is that that we do that you said, what are the features? I like that mm -hmm. word. Yeah. And I also think, I mean, I, I think sometimes there can be a stigma around challenging who we are um, or wanting to change, quote, who we are. And I don't think there should be. I mean, I think that's a very healthy part of the human experience to want to change who you are and how you are. Okay. Um, and I, and I, because when you ask yourself the question, I guess this gets philosophical fairly quickly, but Good. when you ask yourself the question, who am I? Well, really, that's just reduced to the set of thoughts we have and the sets of behaviors that we engage in. And those are all malleable things. Those are all malleable things, right? Um, and so I think the human mind can um, very easily think that, oh, we have this like very essential me quality that's, you know, immutable in some way. But I just don't know if I believe that. Um, and I also just think it's actually a really, again, healthy exercise for every human to say, you know what, I do have this fundamental trait about myself that I don't like. And I would really like to change who I am along that particular dimension. I would love to make that more, um, more culturally acceptable and less stigmatized. Because I think if you probe really deeply, there's a lot of people out there, including myself, who will readily admit um, that they would like to change fundamental parts of who they are. Well, okay, so on that. So let's say that we're there and we're with change. And let, let's use the 
example of work. Mm -hmm. We so often see people who are in a workplace, they don't like, they don't enjoy, it's not giving them life, but they stick with it. It's a golden handcuffs. It provides uh, the benefits and the money and the whatever, to whatever degree or, or level they may be at. And they stay there until then something again happens. They get fired mm -hmm. or there's a merger or yada, yada, what happens. And later on, they say, gosh, it was the best thing that yeah. happened to me. It happened to them, just like your injury happened mm -hmm. to you. And that's of interest to me because let's take that person in the job situation. If they wait till the thing happens to them, they're not really in as healthy of an environment to make the best change as if they mm -hmm. had done it while they still had the job going. They weren't in survival mode. They didn't have to make a decision quick. Yeah. And so in maturity, I don't know if that's a fair word to use. Uh, I'll use it for myself. In there's been things <laughs> where I wish that in maturity, I had gone after it proactively mm -hmm. before I had to react to the, ca uh, the, the, the cause that happened. So are, do you find it often? We kind of wish something happened. You know, I wish I'm going along. I'd like some change. I, I just wish something would happen that would force me as opposed to proactively having to take action when I don't have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, certainly on a personal level, uh, you know, there's a continuum of like risk averse people to risk seeking people right. or change averse to change seeking. And I'm more, cl I'm closer to the risk averse, change averse side. Like I, I like settling into my ways, having habits um, and a routine. If a job is going okay, I just kind of want to stay the course. Uh -huh. And one thing I am personally so grateful for is that life threw me a curveball and forced me right. to have to change and pivot because even though the curve ball denied me of something that I really loved. So unlike the example you described with the job where you're not actually that satisfied, I loved the violin, right. but what that experience taught me was that it was okay for me to run at change in future episodes in my life when I felt I needed to, um, because it would be okay because I had learned from my experience that I could in fact navigate these twists and turns that life can bring uh, my way. And I think without that very formative experience, I might have stayed in things longer than I did, right? So a really good example okay. of this is, um, I was a postdoc. I'm sure so many of your listeners can relate to having invested in a particular career for many, many, many years. And then suddenly you wake up one day and you realize, damn it, this is not what I want to be doing with my life. So this yeah. happened to me. So I, you know, I was a violinist. Then I discovered the science of decision-making, cognitive science. I picked up a book uh, right before college and I fell in love with the field. So I did my PhD in cognitive science. I did a postdoc in cognitive neuroscience. I was on my way to becoming a professor, an academic, right? And then I remember I was in this dark windowless room running fMRI scans on people's brains. So people would come in, I put them in the scanner, I'm looking, peering at images of their brains, trying to figure out, you know, features of decision-making. And in that moment, it just occurred to me, I just don't think given my personality that the order of operations is right here. I mean, yeah. I haven't even had a conversation with this guy. I don't know what his favorite ice cream flavor is. I don't know if he has kids. Like I, I want that human connection first before I do this brain analysis. Um, and I ended up calling my dad. He's a, he's a theoretical physics professor and um, I'd always admired him in his career. And, you know, I, I called him and I was like, pops, I don't know what to do because I've just spent many, many, many years on this path. And I just don't know if this is right for me. And he told me in that moment, he said, you know, don't fall prey to the path of least resistance here. Like, based on everything I know about you, Maya, I also don't know if academia is the perfect fit for you. I think you probably want a more social environment. You love working on teams, um, maybe explore something else. And so that ended up leading, that exploration ended up leading to me having many, many conversations with different folks, including an old undergraduate advisor of mine. And what she told, shared with me was this incredible story of how the federal government was using insights from my field, from cognitive science to help low-income students get access to free lunches at school so that they could thrive. And ultimately, those conversations led me to get the honor of working for President Obama in the White House for four years and completely changed my life forever. And I do wonder, you know, had I not had that experience of having the violin taken away from me and having that change happen to me, um, 
this would never, this change would never have happened in my life. And I'm so immensely grateful that it did, because like I said, it was like one of the most incredible honors to get to serve um, people in this way, but it also challenged my understanding of, of myself and, and, you know, the types of things that I could do in my life. I'm going to come back to this point because I want to stick primarily on the individual, but because you just brought it up and your experience with the Obama administration and your work there, something I've always been in this personal development, self-help health and wellness industry, mm. but that's, that's where I live. That's what I love. That's, that's where I, I enjoy. It's what inspires me. I haven't spent much time on the institutional side. If I can use, if I can mm -hmm. uh, take that out. And yet when we look at cultural change and the one that I tend to be drawn to most is chronic illness and disease. And we look at that and it's, you know, continues to be on this hockey stick mm -hmm. of getting worse. We're getting sicker yeah. and sadder. And it's, it's, it's devastating to me to look at that and think, how are we going to touch that? How are we going to touch this or make a difference in this almost now $5 trillion that we spend you know, in healthcare, so much of it that is preventable. When you look at that scope, do you tend to side on the, this is going to happen from an institutional side, not, well, I'm, I'm baiting that, aren't I? You know, not an individual side. Where do you tend to put your focus when we look at the big picture like that? I think it depends on the role that you're playing. Okay. Um, I mean, I think certainly when we were in government, um, when I was working at the White House, my job was to design public policies and programs right. that reflected our best understanding of human behavior. And so my job was to make sure that the institutions were in service of people trying to achieve their long-term goals and were designed in ways that were effort as effortlessly as possible, helping people um, do things like get access to health care, get right. access to public benefits that could be make or break for, for low-income families. Um, help, like I said earlier, helping low-income students get access to free or reduced price lunches at school, um, helping increase medication adherence among uh, people who, for example, have diabetes, right? Um, and a lot of people, um, or a lot of the programs that, that we design, if, if we aren't thinking about the human psychology point of view, if we're not using that research, well, it can be a totally fine program, but it's not actually meeting the needs of people. And it's not, um, it's not appreciating all the ways in which our psychology is designed. Right. When you look at, I want to go back again to that. I keep thinking of your story. It's so interesting. You never, I've never heard somebody go, yeah, so so-and-so, and they lost a hundred pounds and they kind of regretted it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's a fair statement, but but on that, no, but to, to, to that point, Kevin, okay. I think that's a great observation because again, and this is what I mean by not having these, these clean narratives, because I think yeah. again, we, we so often have these reductionist narratives about the human experience, which is you turn on a, a talk show and it has, you know, six people parading on the stage. Oh, they lost a cumulative 500 pounds. And now life is great forever. Yeah. And you don't follow. It might be great for some folks. Absolutely. Like, power to them. Um, but the human experience is deeply complicated and very complex. And um, in many ways, one, one thing that Elna was forced to confront is that people were starting in her, from her vantage point, people were starting to be nicer to her and give her more things. She was able to get things more easily. And she really resented that. It made her deeply cynical about the world because she thought to herself, you know, she has this device where she talks about old Elna um, and then mm. new Elna. And new Elna is the one who lost all the weight. And she said, you know, old Elna would never have been able to get these things in life, even though old Elna was a much better person than new Elna is. You know, old Elna was like always trying to be kind to people and generous. And she worked so hard. And now here new Elna is um, getting all these societal, societal benefits that she doesn't deserve. Right. Mm. Um, and so I think that yeah, again, there's like, there can be a reductionist narrative out there about what that experience is like. And you, you kind of end the story at the point where people have lost weight and you don't follow what that trajectory is like. And this reminds me of another interview I did recently with a, a black trans man who talks about his experience transitioning from female to male and how he had felt he used the language caged um, in his former body, right? The female body and how he felt so liberated um, when he did transition into a male body, um, but that he felt caged once again, given his 
identity as a black man in this society. Um, and it was a fascinating story because, you know, the gender transition story can also end, you know, at times in this very reductionist way after the transition. But, you know, his story has so much complexity after the fact. You know, he talks about getting pulled over by the cops, um, noticing how he's being received by folks. And I think what his story taught me, kind of similar to Elna's, is we can we can inspire a change within ourselves, um, but we can never control the way that other people change in response to that change. We can't mm -hmm. control how they react to us as a result of the ways in which we've changed. And it, it compelled me to revisit this common refrain we all have, which is, um, oh yeah, it's important to change on your own terms. Well, what does that actually mean, Kevin? Like, what does it actually mean to change on our own terms where we change, but then we can't, um, we can't actually control the way in which our entire environment responds to that change for better or worse. No, it's a great point because it, with, with Elna, she could not change on her own terms because it caused change in the people around her. And it's so, again, so it's so interesting because you would think that the privilege is what she's saying that she then incurred mm -hmm. because of that she was not happy with. And you would think most people are striving to do that. I am racking my brain to think of the analogy that's so fitting here about, all I can think of is the emperor's new robe and that's not it. It's somebody else. What's the analogy? It's the story out there of the guy, this is a super old story, you know, who got a new robe and finally upgraded his robe. And when he did, he then saw that, gosh, especially in comparison, that, that furniture is kind of shabby in the house. And so he upgraded the furniture. And then once he did that, he's like, I gosh, it's actually nicer furniture than the house. I need a new house. And it kept going from there. And again, we're back to this auditing the change. If I make this change, if I make this, and in our context here, uh, an improvement, a betterment change, what is that going to, how is that to, to what you said, how is it going to impact the people around me? Mm -hmm. How will that cause them to react to me. And I've heard plenty of wealthy people uh, complain somewhat that now that I am so wealthy, everybody who comes generally has an agenda of how I can help them, how they can get money mm -hmm. somewhat. And I've heard that, you know, but how is that going to affect them? How, what's it going to require of me, which is what you're talking about here, which yeah, I'm, I'm enamored with is like the audit of change. Uh, maybe that's the title of this. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's so interesting because that, so you know, I, I interviewed Hillary Clinton for this podcast, and we talk about her decision to change her last name. So essentially what happened is, you know, she was in Arkansas working in the 70s. Um, people were not a fan of the fact that despite being the governor's wife, Bill Clinton's wife, um, she was continuing to work her job. Uh, she had kept her, you know, her name and did not take on her husband's last name. Um, she didn't really fit the cookie cutter model that people had in their minds of what the governor's wife ought to even look like, right? She had glasses and she didn't have a stylist and she didn't wear makeup. And people were really resisting this about her. And um, she eventually decided after Bill Clinton lost his you know, re-election race and she was blamed in part for that, which is insane um, because they said, you know, this is in part because you're not willing to play you know, the classic governor's wife role. Um, she decided to change her last name. But what was so interesting to me as we had this conversation is, you know, I saw that as such a major, huge sacrifice. And I, as a woman resented that she had to go through all of that. And what she shared with me is she said, you know, Maya, I think I just, I knew where my line was. I knew what really mattered to me. And that was my ability to do work, influence policy, um, you know, get the job done, so to speak. And I cared less about some of the superficial things like getting a stylist and hair and whatnot. So I was willing to concede on those things. Um, and I knew that they would change the way that people engage with me. But maybe that would actually lead them to focus on the stuff I actually cared about, which was the quality and content of my work. And so uh, I actually named the episode Hillary Clinton changes on her own terms because mm. she taught me that there is a dimension of what it means to change on your own terms, which is in life, we have to pick our battles, right? right. Certainly as women, we often have to pick our battles because we, you know, we have to figure out, okay, when does it make sense to compromise? Uh, when does it make sense to hold our ground, but risk getting kicked out of the arena altogether? And what she taught me is 
she could never control her environment, but what she could control were the features of her, or the, the parts of herself that she was willing to change and the parts of herself that she was absolutely resolute about. And um, you'll see in her story, it's, it's such a fascinating episode. I, I feel like, you know, I, I admire Hillary Clinton. I never learned as much as I did about her um, than I did, list, you know, having this interview um, and her being so open and vulnerable and expressive about this. But um, what I learned is that yeah, there is some stuff she really cared about and she was never willing to cross the line for those things. Well, in this aspect of auditing, we keep talking about it obviously requires or it's going to be helped by more self-awareness, which mm -hmm. she obviously had. So on that note, going to the change that's required when something happens to you. Mm. So something's going to happen to you, which that happened to you. That's that's where your story you know, started in this context. Uh, the pandemic happened to people. If we all sit down now or, or all listening now and we say change is going to happen, some change is going to happen and it's going to be good or, or bad. I'm going to get a, a promotion, but along with that's going to come responsibility um, or I'm going to get an investor. And along with that's going to come, you know, dramatic responsibility. It'd be a good thing, but yeah. what's it, what's going to happen? I'm going to have to respond to that react, respond to that change or the negative thing, the pandemic's going to happen, or a death is going to happen, or a handicap or an injury or something like that's going to happen. Yeah. If we look at that and say those something's going to happen to all of us, in, in some sense, hopefully, uh, how do we best, as you look at the as you audit all these people, prepare for that? Like, what are the traits you use that word earlier that you mm. see that the people who are able to healthfully or successfully, whichever term you want to use, respond to change tend to have that maybe others don't? Yeah, I think it's a flexibility of spirit, really, um, the a hmm. willingness to adapt. And uh, I, I saw this adapt and identify traits within yourself that you can leverage in key moments. So I saw this in spades in the uh, interview I did with Tiffany Haddish for, for a slight change of plan. So she is a world renowned comedian. She has won Emmys, she won a Grammy for best comedy album. She was the first black woman to win this award since the 1980s when Whoopi Goldberg won it. Um, so an incredibly impressive person. And her childhood was filled with profound amounts of trauma. Um, when she was just a little kid, her mom got into a terrible car accident, which ended up causing severe brain damage. Um, and that led this person that she loved so much in the world to become deeply violent um, and you know, physically and emotionally abusive towards her. And Tiffany is in this, again, terrible position where her life has been flipped upside down um, and she doesn't really know how to respond, but she knows that she has the superpower, which is to make people laugh. Like she's identified that she has this gift, like, oh, at school, like I can, I can make people laugh. And rather than just treating it as a recreational hobby, as any child might do, right? That's just a thing I do with my friends or at school. She, she uses it as a weapon to help her get out of dangerous situations and to help her get what she needs and wants in the world. So this is everything from when she senses her mom might be violent, um, temporarily distracting her with a joke to like take her mind, to distract her mom's attention away from potential abuse. Um, she uses humor at school. She, she says she didn't know how to read and um, she you know, needed to uh, get her homework done. So she would make students at school laugh and she would copy their homework or she would ingratiate, um, you know, ingratiate them and, and, and get them to help her with stuff. Um, she ends up having to be moved into the foster care system and she uses humor again to um, engage with her social worker and help score her opportunities like going to comedy camp. Um, and in the future, again, with a therapist who she makes laugh so hard, the therapist says, you know what, you just need to become a comedian. Like you are so funny. I'm a trained mental health professional and I can't keep it together in this, um, in this appointment we have. So I think, you know, the answer is clear. And so that was an incredible and remarkable story of resilience because, um, talk about making the best of an absolutely traumatic, terrible situation. And 
you know, one, most of us can't be Tiffany Haddish. Most of us don't. I mean, I certainly can't even imagine having that level of resilience and, and um, entrepreneurial spirit, which is essentially what she had. She's like, I'm just going to make something out of nothing. Um, but what she did teach me is that when we are confronting a big change or about to confront a big change, again, I'll use the word audit, auditing ourselves for these little superpowers that we all have within us yeah. um, can be a really powerful thing to do um, that we can use at every turn. And it might not be the skills of a internationally renowned com comedian, um, but maybe you have an incredible gift for empathy. Maybe you have an incredible ability to listen to others. Maybe you have um, an, an incredible ability to ask thoughtful questions of people, right? Who, who knows what it is, but everybody's got some trait that's remarkable or incredible. And maybe that is something that can be the one constant throughout the change. Because in many ways for Tiffany, humor was her only constant. Everything else was in a an incredible state of volatility throughout her entire entire childhood. But she saw comedy as that one thing, like, I have this, this is mine. It's not going anywhere. And then she used it at, at every turn. You're, you said flexibility of spirit. You also said resilience. And my, I'll, have to, I'll, I'll admit my own journey from, to make it tangible from from more anxiety to less anxiety mm. you know, into peace has been my awareness of what I am holding on to so tightly. Mm. And that's literally a term that I come back to is to hold things lightly, which sounds bad because we, you know, we're again, this is the personal development. You commit, right? Never yeah. quit and, and you make it happen. <laughs> But I, I, I think there's a, you can hold both of those in there too, because you can't, uh, what I've had to learn, I'll own it for myself is I cannot control everything. I'm not God. Yeah. I'm not Superman. <laughs> um, change is going to happen. And to be at peace with that, because I'm a guy that everybody would say, oh, he's, you talked about being risk averse, mm. that, that I'm, I'm not, man, I'm good with risk. I, it's, it's fun. <laughs> it's change. Well, but it's well, a spectrum a professional cyclist. So to me, that says a lot too. <laughs> well, but it's, but it's a spectrum. So if we're talking yeah. about physical risk or, you know, a, a big effort or something, sure. How about relational risk? No, I suck at that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, to look at that and to look at you saying flexibility of spirit. So if change is going to come, we all are sitting there, change is going to come. There will be yeah. some change that happens to us. And you're saying, your first gut reaction to how do we do that with health? And I'm going to say success is to embrace or begin embracing flexibility of spirit. That's, that's something to ponder. Mm -hmm. um, I want to dig in a little more. You said something interesting. So you okay. said relational risk relation. Mm -hmm. You meant like human relations. Risk, I do. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Can you say a little mm -hmm. more about that? Uh, yeah, I, um, it's interesting. So I'm going to speak from a guy's standpoint, since mm. that's uh, who I am. And I see so many guys who are so valiant. I mean, I see what they're doing. I see the efforts that they're making in their work and in their family and in their desire to uh, serve the world. Mm. And man, they will, they will die, you know, for their family. Let's say that let's, let's use a wife, you know, I'll die for my wife. Yeah. But will you have that hard, hard conversation? Will you, will you consider the change that she would like you to make? And, and every guy is reduced to this little infant. Uh, I, I shouldn't say every, a lot. Okay. A lot of, and I'll put me in there as well. And it made me look at that aspect of risk averse and my co-host on my true life podcast, mm. Dr. Randy James is real big on with everything, you know, with any, anything that we're talking about in regards to our person, we're all on the spectrum. We're not mm -hmm. this or that. We're not risk averse or not risk averse. Because mm -hmm. I see people who you would say, man, they are so risk averse. And yet I look at them maybe relationally and think, man, they're, they're kings. They're mm -hmm. amazing in that. But we tend to give the kudos or the label of that to these really tangible things of they started a business. They're not afraid to do whatever. They risk yeah. this thing that we see out here. But in the personal life, I see a lot often of timidness that doesn't translate over. And it just made me question the labels that we give to ourselves. Yeah. Now, have you found that you have tried to cultivate a greater <clears throat> willingness to change in the relationship space? Or do you feel um, in some ways, okay, I, I am this way, I'm, I'm risk averse. Um, well, you know, let's just have that be 
the case? Well, no, no. I mean, I don't ever want to be that. It's a hard thing to do. <laughs> uh, it, it is. I, so I, I would say I recognize my nature. Hmm. So it is my nature. I am, I am significantly conflict averse. Hmm. Um, so I recognize that. So then am I making efforts to be different? Yes. And so that would be back to that concept of inherent change in ourselves. Yeah. I wish that one, I, I would like inherent change in that one. I don't see a benefit from that one. That is one that causes me struggle. I, I don't see a, an upside to that one. So it's a recognizing and, and an effort to give myself grace in that as well. Mm -hmm. But then do I want different results that would require a change in me? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons, well, first of all, thanks for sharing that. I think one of the reasons I ask is, you know, one of my guests on a slight change of plans, his name is Tommy Caldwell, and he's considered the greatest big wall climber in the world. Mm -hmm. By the way, he only has nine fingers. He I, cut I, off one I, of his I fingers listened. in a woodchopping accident. Uh, incredible life story. Yeah. He was held captive in Kyrgyzstan, nearly died of starvation and hypothermia and potentially the risk of just getting, you know, killed by one of his captors. And he did say, you know, very few people in their life get the ability to see what they're capable of in these, yeah. in these moments, these rare moments where life pushes you to your limits and tests you. And that when you come out the other side, alive and healthy, you feel a kind of reassurance about it all. Like I've seen the worst. And so now I know, um, he's like, I don't fear failure or fear anymore after that experience. Like he just doesn't, he, he came hmm. so close to the worst moments of his life that, that things just feel like, and he survived them. Right. So he feels reassured. And I, and I do wonder whether when it comes to an aversion to that, that kind of relational change or conflict or whatnot. And again, I'm sure Kevin, you're not the only one um, who feels this way. So many people feel this way that, that forcing that push in their lives where they just force the conflict once uh, or twice. And it, you know, they muster up all the courage in the world to try to just inspire that um, will leave them feeling like, whoa, I did that and nothing terrible happened. We're all still alive. We're still together. Okay, maybe I have what it takes. And I, I say this because you, your earlier comment got me reflecting on the fact that in the same way that I'm change averse and I needed this thing thrown at me saying, you can't play the violin anymore. It's a forced change that I didn't want, but it got me thinking differently. I wonder if we can force, um, you know, a risk-seeking attitude in some, in some sense uh, in these areas of our lives where we feel a little bit more close-minded or, or a little bit fearful. Y yes. And your story of uh, the guy who got cancer and yeah. It's, I won't forget that Maya, uh, yeah. because yeah, him looking at it going, gosh, if I had understood the psychology, understood, you know, what happened, uh, to me, I wouldn't have feared it so exactly. much I, again in the auditing. I want to come back to, it'd be a great yeah. thing to make my fear list. And I think, what is the outcome really? Is it going to be as bad? Because as you say that I am so aware of when I do step in and yeah. I enter into that conflict, it's really never as bad as I Mm -hmm. as the biggest fear. I'm still averse to it, <laughs> yeah. but I'm having to train myself to do that. Just like an athletic event where you just go in and work out. If I want a bigger bicep, I go work it out. So gosh, again, I, am I, am I waking up in the morning and go, man, I'm going to go after conflict today. <laughs> I, I don't do that. I will and say, I don't know if that would be a good way to live either. <laughs> that not, might be a little too intense. What, well, uh, to be frank with it, the thing that I do uh, that a counselor has helped me do is be aware of my own emotional dashboard. And right there in this moment, I am, I'm about, to, I'm, I'm wanting to shut down. I want to run. Mm -hmm. That's the red flag, Kevin, be aware of that to now enter into the conflict. It's for the health of the relationship as well. Yeah. And it's me not building walls and becoming bitter. That's on the mm -hmm. other side of it. So mm -hmm. being aware of what's on the other side of not risking. Yes. Yes. No, that makes total sense. Um, look, I, I think the fact that you're even able to talk so openly about these things is a testament, uh, to the fact that, you know, whatever, you know, whatever work you're doing with your counselor is clearly paying off. I, I find it to be a, a very brave thing to admit to and something that's so relatable. Well, again, this, this topic that you're covering my, and why I'm eager to promote, uh, you and this, new show is because I feel like we take change. And as most words do, it has 
kind of the common baggage to it. Change is there. And I think we're looking at it wrong and hearing the stories that you're covering on the show help us see it from so many different viewpoints and to realize that even on that, on change, that we're all on that spectrum. I, you know, I just went on a, a getaway by myself and I went to different mountain biking courses. Mm. It was awesome. And I'm totally happy going out someplace where I do not know where I'm at and getting lost in essence. But then I realized, man, in my normal day to day, like today, I go out generally on the exact same routes over and over and over with no change. And you look and go, gosh, that doesn't make sense. Well, it's because when I'm doing that, I'm generally looking to just get in my zone. I'm just looking for flow mm -hmm. to, to Stephen <laughs> Kotler. I'm just looking yeah. to get into flow and I may be looking to think on something else. And I can do that when I'm not having to think about where I am at. I'm on familiar territory. So again, we're looking at this spectrum and even the day to day of is this, do I want change now? Do I want change in this area or do I want the norm. And we're looking at, again, I'm back to that word audit that we've worn out on the show, but I, I love great it. One. Well, yeah, it's what you're, it was a really good word. It is. And it's what you've got me thinking about in regards to what do we want and then what change will that require? And then really auditing what is, well, to what you said, I guess, what, what's the ripple effect going mm -hmm. to be? Uh, as far as where we find joy. Well, again, I, I'm a fan, obviously, of what you're doing. Thank you. I will be uh, tuning into it. And it's helping me because I, I care so much about this topic for myself and for my audience. So um, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to be on the show. And thank you for the effort you're making in this arena. Well, thanks so much, Kevin. I love it when an interview feels more like a conversation. Um, and I appreciate the, you know, the fantastic questions you asked, but even more importantly, um, all the things that you shared, it's given me a lot of food for thought. Um, and I think, you know, as I continue to build out a slight change of plans, um, I think a lot of the insights you share will, will help shape the way that I approach different conversations. So I really well, appreciate that. Thank you. I'm honored, Maya. All right. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs>